Development Cooperation and South South Cooperation. We are very fortunate to have Mr. Amar Sinha, Secretary, Economic Relations, uh, Ministry of External Affairs, and uh, Dr. Radesh Tandon, President of Priya New Delhi, to co-chair. I would request the chair to take over with his uh, initial remarks. Mr. Sinha. Is this working? Yeah, it is. <coughs> well, uh, I'm happy to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's been, well, afternoon of the second day of this conference, so there must be some fatigue, uh, no matter how interesting the topic is. Uh, but we are discussing today, actually, the role of Indian civil society, CSOs, CEOs, and private companies in development partnership. Uh, needless to add that, uh, of course, we have a long history of development partnership. Uh, I guess sharing was part of our, or is part of our uh, cultural ethos. Uh, but increasingly, as India has grown, uh, we have found that South-South cooperation, where we could actually reach out to developing uh, countries, share our own experiences, which we find are quite relevant in their own development efforts. So we have focused, uh, we have put a renewed focus on that. And some of the concrete examples are, as you can see, uh, whether within SARC uh, and the uh, guiding principle of Sabka SARC, Sabka SARC, that is in Russian for all, uh, or the India-Africa Forum Summit, uh, which uh, brings India with all its uh, various uh, 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 African development partnership uh, countries uh, together. And the new commitments that India has made in terms of lines of credit for Africa, which is substantial height from uh, what we had done earlier, uh, the scholarships, capacity building. So basically, India has focused in, I would say, a little bit of infrastructure, but mainly in terms of capacity building and training and human resource, where we feel that we have these strengths. <coughs> Needless to add that not all these efforts could be done by the governments alone. So obviously, most of our assistance is channeled through private uh, sector uh, companies. The role of civil society organizations till now has been limited, but increasingly we see that there is, uh, among the new CSOs or NGOs, I would like to prefer to call them actually uh, the more traditional way of uh, identifying them, uh, that they are stepping out into areas which uh, I guess Indians have not stepped into. Uh, including in areas which are war torn. Uh, Afghanistan, we have seen a huge uh, number of uh, private individuals who have come out uh, to share their experience and expertise. Uh, so, we have a very interesting panel here, uh, drawn from uh, private sector, from CSO, from other academia. Uh, and I'll give my co chair, Mr. Tandon, uh, the mic to introduce them. Uh, and also, of course, also lay the ground rules. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, as uh, the focus of this uh, hours of work, and we will try and restrict ourselves to an hour max because there is a closing session after this, and I'm sure people have other plans for the evening. Uh, the focus is the role of civil society, the private sector, and uh, academic networks and coalitions in promoting South-South cooperation. And uh, we want to particularly uh, emphasize that this is a not a new area of our understanding. And uh, way back in the 1960s, uh, some of you may remember that uh, Indian voluntary sector, uh, non-governmental sector, developed the India Mark II hand pump which was then, with the help of it and other UN agencies, popularized in many African countries. The innovation that happened on Indian soil through the work of civil society has spread in many parts of the world. Our private sector initiatives go back also in history. So when we talk about South-South cooperation, typically the discourse limits itself to G to G, government to government. But I think we need to begin to understand not only the value of multi-channel cooperation that has been in existence, but perhaps to look at how that multi-channel could converge. 
it seems to me that in our experience so far, G2G happens at one level, private sector to private sector happens at another level, civil society to civil society at another level. And I would uh, encourage all of you to think about, including us as panelists this afternoon, how this can become a convergent multi-channel cooperation. Because uh, if we do it just ourselves, then it is not really holistic. We bring complementary sets of capacities, resources, and uh, I think doing it together may add much more value to South-South cooperation than has been the case in the day. We have an excellent panel. We, we had a brief chat. We said, well, each of you will speak for two, three minutes, and uh, we will figure out a way to shut you up politely, which is not always easy. Um, and uh, other than our um, SARC Development Fund, Dr. Mutwal, who is here, who has uh, requested for a short PPT, the rest of our speakers will use their vocal cords. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and we will rely on that. Uh, there is no particular order in which our speakers will come. I'm just going to use the order which is on the sheet so that uh, for some of you it may be easier to relate the speaker with the name on the program. Uh, Shankar Venkateshwar, Tata Sustainability Group. You go first, Shankar. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Opening uh, on, 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 the, on, on such a late stage of the conference, but let me give it a shot. So thank you, uh, uh, thank you the organizers and good afternoon. Uh, I work with the Tata group of companies, so what I'm going to try and share in the next couple of minutes is sort of the role that private sector, in my view, can play, based on some of the experiences that we as a Tata group have had. We are a very large and spread out uh, group of companies. So I'll try and leverage some of our learnings and understanding to see how uh, South South cooperation can be enhanced by the private sector. So I think that, in my view, there are two or three different ways that this can happen. One is certainly by the transfer of practice, especially practice around work that companies do with communities or in the products and services that they deliver. Uh, through uh, uh, as part of what we do, but where they serve communities who are at the base of the pyramid. Uh, one obvious way to do that is when companies have a presence across different countries in the South. Uh, how can they learn from what they are doing in one country and and sort of use it in another? So, for example, one of our companies, Tata Chemicals, has a presence uh, in India and has a presence in Morocco, has a presence in Kenya. And they end up a lot of conversations with each other. And some of the practices and, and programs, say around water, is something that they try and do commonly across uh, all the countries that they work. So there's transfer of practice, there's transfer of, of learning, and there is, uh, there is uh, uh, sharing uh, of, of what can happen. And I have to say that, uh, you know, and it has to be that way, that it has to be a two way process. It's not that what uh, happens in India is the best, certainly not. I think there's a lot of practices that the Indian company has picked up from some of the work that's happening in Kenya, and that is uh, in fact being used here. So I think sharing practices in a two-way process, especially when you are uh, working in multiple countries, is an excellent way for, for that practice to then become uh, more widely uh, used and shared and understood and adapted uh, to those circumstances. The second one is, is the more obvious one, sharing of knowledge. So, uh, so even if you don't have a presence in another southern country, uh, the, what is very obvious is that a lot of the practices uh, tend to be, uh, in some cases, uh, or some, some of the practices that are better known and, and documented in our repositories tend to be very novel. Uh, I don't think there is enough robustness of the kind of, of, of documenting the kind of good practices in the south which are more relevant for all of us uh, who work in the South and live in the South. So some role for, uh, for that to happen is something I think that can be very helpful. 
both in terms of just say creating these uh, these, these case studies, putting them up and uh, putting them up in repositories, and also I think at the end of the day, nothing beats. Uh, actual physical movement and visits to some of these kinds of practices. So whether that's something that through the ages of uh, the various South South Corporation entities, uh, which are, as I just said, uh, and secretary mentioned, tend to be by government, uh, can they be also towards visits and understanding of some of these activities that civil society and, in my case, uh, private sector does? Uh, can that be a way of forwarding and, and making the learning more, more widespread. Uh, it's challenging because I think even creating a repository for practice in India itself is hard enough and when we're talking across the South it's even more harder. But I think it's, a, it's an exercise well worth doing, it's an investment well made and I think everybody could certainly benefit on the, from that. A third element and, and this is actually a subset of the others but I think it's an interesting one is in disaster response. And I particularly take the case of what happened uh, very recently in Nepal, where the Indian private sector uh, actually were very actively engaged in helping the people of Nepal in being able to cope with that, uh, that disaster. One of the things that we know is that disasters, natural disasters, climatic disasters are going to get more and more frequent. That's the impact of climate change, and we know that even if we stop sending any carbon out, we're still going to have that happening in great degrees. Droughts, floods, and all kinds of such disasters. And I think uh, the, south, the South is going to be particularly affected by a lot of them. And so therefore, there is a lot to be learned in terms of how to cope, how to deal with disasters, how to respond to them. And I think there is a connectivity that we need to have. And this can happen again in two ways. Again, through a sharing of knowledge of how to build uh, resilience and how to uh, then respond to some of them. Uh, as, as well as in terms of just physically being able to respond. And, and I took the case of Nepal, and I think uh, that's just an example of what the private sector can do in terms of responding. Uh, one of the things that uh, one must remember is that community interventions uh, tend to be, from private sector, tend to be where they have a stake, where they have a, where they have a business interest, and that's natural. But when it comes to humanitarian crisis, many companies tend to to uh, be willing to do it because it's the right thing to do. And I would say, for example, in our case in Nepal, we didn't have necessarily a business interest in Nepal, but, uh, but humanitarian crises tend to overcome that need to sort of stay with stakeholders. So these are some of, some of the ideas that I thought, I, I think, uh, that we could look at and explore and see how we could take that from. I'll stop there, Rajesh, and uh, I'm happy to take the discussion. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is also from the private sector, Indian private sector, Ms. Vinita Sethi from Bharti Airtel. Um, I think uh, Venkateshwaran has really given us a good backing order now to follow. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to really speak from uh, the experience of Airtel in 17 nations of Africa. And uh, I think the, the underlying of it was in all our operations, all the countries was to be really socially responsive corporate. And um, technology was something we knew uh, was our strength, and probably in some places that was all that we have. So we really harnessed technology to make an impact on the communities in which we were working. And um, if I can just quickly um, uh, take you through some of the uh, parameters that guided us in what we did. One was, of course, the use of technology. Uh, which was, uh, we felt very well connected with uh, bringing education. And so education became a prime focus of Asian operations in most African nations. Uh, we're running almost, um, uh, the numbers that I have now are, uh, you know, almost uh, 50 schools with 25,000 students. And what went hand in hand with this was capacity building in terms of training the youth, training the teachers. So um, uh, the important things in this program as a lesson for us was, one, business alignment of course happened and helped us be great on our IT resources. Two, we realized it was very important and we were very uh, fortunate to work with the government this for each of these countries. Uh, so just to give you an example, for example, in Kenya, we worked with, uh, uh, very closely with the Kenyan government in providing internet connections to almost uh, 61 schools and call them the hubs. 
uh, which also provides online education to work for free for these kids. Um, similarly, we had, um, uh, you know, in uh, Madagascar, maternal health care programs with the government. So uh, the, the role of government as a stakeholder in our uh, corporate responsibility was huge. Uh, again, we had very important, and this was a voluntary effort, to reach out to other stakeholders. So we did work with the Global Peace Foundation, with the British Council, with various UN agencies. And this was not just in education, so you know, it gave us an opportunity to expand into other areas, and these were local needs based. So we didn't really restrict ourselves to ICT. So when it was Ebola, we were able to uh, uh, use the ICT platform, the mobility connects we had, and work with Africa United against Ebola campaign. Uh, when uh, this is a very interesting project, which actually uh, I'm deeply um, uh, impressed with, is uh, I Africa, and this this is a biodigester project, and it was very interesting. No way it connects with Airtel's uh, core, but. Um, uh, this I Africa is a biodigester which we uh, in Airtel with some other stakeholders in Kenya uh, funded. And uh, what was happening was that this is an NGO I, I Africa. It's, it's a project which works for rehabilitation of street boys. Uh, so a lot of time for these boys was being spent in using the fossil fuels to you know cook for them, boil water for them. And the NGO approached the Airtel of the he could. Uh, device a more renewable energy source. So from there it started, and uh, I think we're looking at more projects in the area of biodigesters. So I, I think this was uh, this is an example of a corporate that moves from its core strength of ICT to providing clean energy resources. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that it's very important when you are in any community to really understand the needs of that community to see where all you can provide the best fit and if need be, to be able to diversify. But there again, it's very important to get these community and the stakeholders to become your partners. Um, so from education, we also moved to several health-related projects. There were some gender-related projects. Uh, we also did the livelihood projects. And um, the third important criteria for us, and I think because we were in Africa, was to see the scalability of each project. And this was also from the point of view of aligning the project with, uh, with a systematic plan to build capacities across different countries and see which models and best practices could be transferred the best. This is the point which Venkateshwin has also made, and I totally agree that any project to really get that push, the momentum needs to be scalable. Uh, they, they, there's a very fine point, uh, and this is trying to get your employees to volunteer. And um, we, we, have a very, we have a lot of positive stories of volunteerism. Uh, in Africa. In fact, our employees were um, really at the forefront in water conservation projects with some of the Aetan offices led, um, even in sanitation projects in schools. And um, I, I really don't know whether they carried the best practices from India to Africa or learned in Africa and did the projects. But uh, as we go forward, uh, there is going to be a lot more synergy. And I think Within Africa, there is a lot that Aetel Africa is learning from each country that we are operating in. So uh, in conclusion, I, 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 just, I just want to make um, a, a small point here that we have recognized the strength of ICT, which incidentally so has the UN amongst the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And I think we are all ready to use ICT as the common denominator in all the socially responsive community projects that we are going to undertake. Thank you, thank you, Vinika. Both these uh, private sector presentations, you know, bring out some very interesting parallels, uh, if I may. On the one hand, initiatives which are in alignment with business, type of business you are in, but on the other hand, going beyond that and responding to local needs, local initiatives. And this is what makes uh, the South South cooperation through private sector so much more interesting and sustainable. Let me move on now to Dr. Paolo Estip, who is from the BRICS Policy Center of Rio. Paolo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, uh, let me uh, express how grateful I am uh, for being here. Thanks, Sachin and uh, the RIS uh, uh, for flying me here. 
uh, it is a privilege to take part in this um, uh, Daily Chill conference. Uh, I learned several things from uh, yesterday to today, but I learned two important things for this presentation. First one, we, we should not have uh, more than three points. And the second one, we should present as tweets, right? <laughs> Uh, so I have three points and a short story, uh, and I will begin with the short story. Exactly one year ago, I was in Mozambique uh, validating a research we conduct in uh, 2014, in the, uh, 2014 actually. Uh, and I, I was, uh, it was a validation workshop uh, with several uh, Mozambican stakeholders, and the phrase that I heard the most was how imperialist uh, was Brazil, uh, and uh, 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 that Brazil could be even worse uh, than the colonial power uh, uh, Portugal. Uh, and they were, the Mozambicans were referring uh, uh, not specifically to uh, Brazilian South-South cooperation, but especially to Brazilian uh, private, private investments in Mozambique. Uh, either uh, through Vale, everybody knows Vale, uh, uh, we had a recent tragedy in Brazil, uh, uh, or uh, through uh, a private fund that Bellini knows well uh, uh, in the north of Mozambique, uh, private investment fund. Uh, so that's the short story. Uh, I have three points. The first one is how uh, central or how important became private, uh, uh, the private sector for the development landscape. Uh, I made this point in the morning. If we take Addis Ababa Agenda for Action, uh, the SDGs and the COP21 in Paris, we are going to believe that the market will save us all uh, and uh, the private companies will actually uh, solve uh, the problems of development and growth. I know it's not uh, 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 as uh, easy as I'm, uh, I'm saying, but the private companies, the private sector has an, a very central role uh, in, the, in, the, in the development landscape. And instead of being an answer, I think that we have several questions in our hands. That's, our, that's my first point. It is central. It is central for all the agendas that we have nowadays. Uh, but it raises more questions than answers. Uh, than answer uh, the questions we have uh, we had before. The second one, uh, 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 the second point is uh, what questions uh, is, is exactly what questions the, the private sector raises. The first one is its uh, impact on traditional Bolgay and uh, uh, South South cooperation. In terms of traditional Bolgay, we heard just uh, 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 one hour ago. Uh, how uh, uh, ODA funds are being channeled to, to support uh, private investment in developing countries. And we don't know yet uh, what, uh, what would be the effect of this. The second question uh, is, is related to the responsibility of, uh, uh, of the private sector. The second question that the private sector raises is the responsibility of the private sector itself uh, beyond uh, philanthropy and corporate social responsibility reaching uh, business critical decisions encompassing ESG factors, environmental social governance factors, and its impact in the countries that uh, 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 these companies are actually investing. Uh, responsibilities in terms of transparency and accountability. We know that private companies are accountable for their shareholders, but are they accountable for the, for the local population uh, in, the, in the places they are uh, actually operating? Uh, that, I think, is a question that we have to raise and uh, we have to, uh, uh, to be aware uh, or a kind of a, a tension or contradiction that we have to be, uh, to be aware. The third point that I, I, would, uh, I would like to raise uh, uh, for our debate here, uh, and the final one, uh, is the relationship between private sector and South-South cooperation. As, I, uh, 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 as we could uh, understand in Mozambique, for instance, uh, what we have uh, is, uh, uh, as far as South-South cooperation, the, the, the line between uh, technical cooperation and investment and trade is not well drawn, uh, uh, is not well uh, delimited. Uh, what, we, uh, what we can see is a confusion or a, a, a mix 
uh, between uh, uh, the private sector and the uh, uh, South-South cooperation, which can actually erode the legitimacy uh, of South-South cooperation projects uh, 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 in the South. Uh, sorry, in the South, for, for, for sure. Uh, uh, the second question is transparency at home and abroad. How uh, the state uh, or how the public agencies that are carrying on South-South cooperation projects uh, they relate to uh, uh, private, to the private sector. That raises a problem at home. Uh, we are seeing something like that in Brazil uh, exactly now. Uh, uh, and it can raise these problems abroad. Just to give you an example, uh, in Mozambique, uh, there is a South African investment in Mozambique in gas. Uh, uh, and the documents, the contracts were secret, were, uh, uh, keep, were kept secret from the population. Uh, Mozambican's NGOs, they had to go uh, to New York, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, stock market, uh, to actually get the contract and see exactly what would be the terms. So uh, the lack of transparency also uh, uh, is, a, is a, a threat uh, to the legit legitimacy of South-South cooperation in these uh, uh, countries. Uh, and the third point is related to social, ambient, social and uh, uh, ambiental uh, safeguards. What kind of safeguards uh, uh, our countries are actually imposing or using uh, to foster uh, private investment or to support private investment abroad? So these three points, the centrality of, uh, 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 of the private sector, the challenges posed by the, child, the private sector uh, in general, in, in particular to South-South cooperation are the points I would like to raise. Thank you, Chair. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now, uh, let me go on to Dr. Sunil Mogibal. He's the CEO of SAG Development Fund in Thimpo. Social, social progress, poverty elevation, 
and the main focus, as I told you, that is the regional integration and cooperation among the SAR, con SAR countries. So as you know that South Asia is the least integrated uh, region of the world. It's only 2.5% integrated and no country within the SAR is interacting or doing any trade and investment in comparison to any other part of the world. The each country is interacting and doing the business outside the SAR. It's very unfortunate. So this fund was especially created by the head of the states in order to provide the opportunity to the member states to work together. So SDF corpus as on date is a 1.5 million US dollar and we have some voluntary contribution, 100 million come from India as a voluntary contribution to fund non-India projects and China has also contributed around 1.5 million and we are trying to mobilize some new funds through the collaboration with the other international organizations such as the World Bank, ADB, Asian, Asian Infrastructure Bank, NDB Bank and recently I've been called by the president of ADB also, or president of ADB as well as the president of Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank to sign the agreement and to work together for the South Asia. Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has agreed to treat SDF as the custodian of their fund for South Asia. Our objective is to form a consortium of funding agency in order to fund the project, especially in the infrastructure sector where capital or intense project, which we cannot fund because ours is a new fund which was established about five years back. So these are the three funding we know what we could see. That is the one is the social sector, infrastructure sector, economic sector. Social sector is a combination of grant and loan. The other two windows is going to be a soft on loan on the long period of time. So, and we are funding as a date, uh, loan as well as a grant. It could be a combination of loan and grant also. The, social, the role of the SDF in the social sector government is very important through which we are working very closely with the various organizations to work out the South South cooperation. As on date, we have committed $70.27 million for the 10 projects. And uh, this project, which includes livelihood oriented, women empowerment, MCH, the health oriented, agriculture, ICT, e governance, rehabilitation of the stu uh, students, especially in the education sector, plus WASH. So, out of this, 37 million has been already dispersed during the last three years of time. Now, our association with the CSOs like SEVA is very important, it's a very great example which has created a regional cooperation, regional integration among the South Asian countries. SEVA is a very famous organization based in India and uh, it's about membership of more than 1.2 million people and this fund, uh, this particular project was related to the women empowerment in South Asia, especially for the home based workers. So here we have funded around 21 million dollars out of this project, 21 million dollars, the result the impact is that the 20 people, 20,000 people have got the employment directly and indirectly also benefited and 5,000 people have been trained also in different skills. So this project is right now doing a great impact. It's our flagship project. It has created an impact for the marginalized people, especially at the grassroots level. So this project has provided the social impact as well as the development impact also. So that's the organization which has created a very good example for South South Cooperation. So CEO is one of the area where we are working very closely with a number of other NGOs also, especially in the social sector. So within the social sector, we are going to launch a program very soon, which is known as a South, uh, or is known as the Social Enterprise Development Program. This program could be in collaboration with the UNDP or World Bank. This is what we are going to decide very shortly. This pro under this program, eight or ten social enterprises are going to be funded by us in the form of a loan come grant. Uh, in all the 80 countries. So that could be seen as a major impact at the grassroots level for providing the regional cooperation. The possible role in the SDGs is going to be very important for us. Uh, as for our earlier project, I have told you recently that uh, under this MDGS, we are already implementing the 10 projects, plus three more projects are also in the pipeline, which is uh, consists of uh, two projects from the UNDP. Recently, we signed the agreement with the UNDP for the regional integration. These projects are going to be implemented very shortly. Uh, so under the SDG, we are going to cover around 9 to 10 areas for the social oriented project or it could be economic oriented project also by which it will create a big impact in South Asia. These are the possible uh, role what we are looking forward to work with other international institutions also for the, for the SDGs which includes poverty, hunger, health, water, sanitation, gender, economic growth, infrastructure, partnership. But some of the major green field projects we are right now considering is that uh, energy oriented project which could be a renewable energy and SDF has already contributed as, as I told you 80 million dollars 
So we do expect to contribute more in the same field, especially for the economic sector. The economic sector could be trade, investment, business, as well as agriculture, ICT also. So this is a brief presentation, just to give you an idea. I am looking forward to get some new project proposal from the member states uh, in order to fund these projects. And I am open to discuss and answer any questions. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you very much. May I now invite our colleague from United Nations Volunteering, Dr. Myron Bernier, based in Bangkok. Thank you very much. Um, the United Nations Volunteer Program is um, the organization that is mandated to actually promote volunteerism and work with uh, the member states to create an enabling environment for, for volunteering. Um, we are actually not usually part of the discussion on sites, or the formal discussion on South South, but we mobilize 7,000 volunteers uh, on a yearly basis that are, and 80 percent are coming from the South. So South South Exchange, true volunteer action, is actually happening for uh, many years. Um, there is a clear momentum at the moment with the sustainable development uh, goals to give a much more predominant role to volunteering. Um, an agenda that calls for leaving no one behind, that calls for uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships. Um, when the whole consultations on the development of the sustainable development goals um, uh, took place, the Secretary General uh, also in his report uh, mentioned specifically the role that volunteer, um, the volunteerism can play in uh, broadening constituency participation and mobilizing constituency for, for development impact. Um, the second element, why there's a momentum, the first one is that the context of the sustainable development, the second one is the evolution of volunteering. While uh, it's, if you look historically, after the Second World War, it was really a north-south model, really. Um, over the years, a number of uh, southern countries started first developing their national volunteer program and really started looking from a beneficiary, but more from how can I engage my citizen in contributing as well to, to development. And, um, and now we see that most of southern countries actually have their program through CSOs, through the government, through corporate, corporate companies. I'm glad to hear very, you know, there's so good examples here in India no, of how citizens are, are engaged. Um, and and uh, they are looking now at how uh, now mid countries in the 1990s started developing their their uh, South South Cooperation Volunteer Program as well. But this is still in development, and a number of southern countries want to scale up their local volunteer program and bring them to the to the national level, uh, to the um, cooperation level in the context of their of their ODAs. So there's really a momentum. Um, and um, UNV in, with the Beijing Volunteer Federation in China last October, we thought this was an opportunity in the context of the, the discussion on the sustainable development goals to bring a number of actors from the South, and there were more than 100 uh, participants, to reflect about the role that volunteer can play and what is needed to actually strengthen uh, that, that collaboration. Because, um, a number, and I'll not say it, I think everybody like volunteering. You, you have in your mind, I'm sure everybody has in their mind someone they know, activities they do. Everybody's for volunteering. But when it's time to take a stand and see how they're really contributing to development, it's a little bit hard to make a point. No? And uh, one of the key conclusions, well, I'm going to, yeah, four points that were some of the recommendation coming from all the participants from the, from the southern countries that were gathered there. The first one is really better document how volunteerism is contributing uh, to those efforts in South South Cooperation. There are many examples, uh, but then it's hard to measure how exactly it is contributing. So better understanding uh, and better sharing practices would help. Um, another comment was also, another recommendation was to ensure that we have reciprocal exchange and that the principles of South South Cooperation are really embedded into the um, and into those volunteer programs. There, were, there are some criticism as well to volunteer, and there is a uh, top down that has an agenda that you go for two months, then you go with the sustainability. So how we build really longer term exchanges that are not bounded into one assignment, one person going, but really build on a longer term uh, cooperation. No? And that uh, volunteers over time can help building that agenda. Um, another one was around uh, the engagement of youth, especially in the South, the, the very big population of youth, and how it's a way to actually increase 
um, understanding and citizenship of youth population. Uh, a, a lot of private companies, they really uh, um, see the, the technical skills of the volunteers, but sometimes they say, oh, the, the whole putting it into the broader picture of development challenges is, uh, is, uh, is difficult. Through volunteer action, you can actually develop those skills. No? So really developing tailored specific programs for, for youth volunteers. Um, of course, all this needs to happen with a very strong policy support and frameworks uh, that allows the society to engage and, and, and participate and bring volunteers into the development discussions. That would be the fifth one. And uh, another one is, uh, the last one I would say, is how we can enhance um, the use of technology to promote engagement and participation. Through collaboration with the private sector, we can uh, first through online platform, people can contribute from anywhere. You just need a computer now and you can connect and provide your skills for free to someone who needs it somewhere. Um, so it can be either through uh, technology that can be used for expanding the contribution that, that citizens can, can contribute and how we can challenge those collaboration, private CSOs, multilateral to actually enhance that movement. So. Um, I will leave it there. I don't want to uh, expand too much, but I, I'm very pleased to see a multi a multi stakeholder panel here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me now invite uh, Harsh Jekli from Barney. Thank you, sir. Uh, before starting the presentation, I would like to share my information. That you know, our parliament is in session. And those who are observing it, they know that there is a lot of debate, discussion, walkouts are going on. But day for yesterday, a unique thing happened. Our MPs, cutting across their party lines, appreciated one ministry. You know which one? They appreciated the functioning of Ministry of External Affairs. Now, why I am saying so? Because there is one thing we have in our debate, discussions with MEA here in India, we realize that in our international development cooperation, we need to have a multi-dimensional and multi-stakeholder approach. And I think the formation of FADC is one part of that. And since the beginning of FADC, we have between conversation, discussion that how academia, civil society and government can work together to make the international development cooperation <coughs> more relevant. But in my presentation, I am not going to talk about India or I am not going to talk about... Uh, uh, I am giving just general observation. One is that you know, since yesterday we have been discussing about principles of South-South cooperation. There is one very important uh, principle which we discussed was we share the common history. And when we share the common history, we also want to share the common future. But we share the common reality also today. And if you want to have a common future, we need to learn how to share our success and failures among each other in southern countries. We should see that we don't repeat the mistakes which others have done, we should do new mistakes. We don't have luxury of resources to do you know, repeated mistakes. I think this is one of the things that we should learn from each other Secondly, you know, the civil society or NGOs, whatever word you can use, they, in India we use voluntary organizations. Not only in India, all over the world, they are known for the innovations. Dr. Tandon gave one example. But everywhere you will find, and it's south or north, there are so many innovations done. These innovations are related to service delivery. Because we operate in a difficult situation, difficult area where otherwise services don't reach. That's the that's a relevance of our civil society in every country. So the you know, the innovation in service delivery, the innovation in uh, research, evaluation, in policy formulation, helping in policy, policy articulation, and impact assessment. Whether what we are doing is making any impact in the lives of people or not. I think these things are there with the civil society, which can be, which can be seen as a contribution in international development cooperation in South South region. We must also share one thing that our problems today, whether it's a health, or it's education, or it's a social problem, economic problem, they are not simply only a technical problem with technical solutions. It requires, a, as I said, a multi-dimensional approach with a multi-stakeholder participation. Secondly, you know, relationship between CSOs of one country to the other CSO of other countries, like Vani is a national platform in India, but like this there are almost 60 other national platforms worldwide, out of which 40 are in southern countries. I think we need to work to find out that how CSO to CSO relationship can be built and also CSO and government relationship. See, for example, we have been trying and you know we have a C20 and uh, India is going to have its uh, summit uh, I think this year and then 
G20 also is going to happen. We are all trying that how we can have a structured participation of civil society in such policy dialogues. Because that's how we can contribute the experience of civil society in those policy formulations. Uh, one point which was there in the brief which was given to us about the CSRs. You know, one thing in India, as far as I know, is uh, not, and not any other country has such law which says that you spend 2% of your uh, the final, 2% uh, you know, out of your profit on uh, CSR. <coughs> and we have seen in the last few years that there has been very good innovations of implementing the CSR between private sector and NGOs. It's a new in India. We all are learning with our mistakes. We, might, we will improve in future. Today, we all say that it is more related to philanthropy than to the question of justice or right. But maybe gradually we will all mature enough to work on this direction. But whatever we are doing now, whatever we are expecting, we are learning from our experience, that can be replicated in other countries. We can start with those companies, say for example, Indian companies working in other countries. There is no legal binding. You can't take Indian money outside uh, India. But at least, but at least you can think of working around your, uh, you know, establishments with local civil society. That's how we can, you know, bring the changes in the life of people. <coughs> so lastly, I would like to say the important thing here is that the question of communication and the question of conversation. We need to have platforms. We need to have, you know, structures where civil society can communicate, where private sector can communicate, and where government can communicate with each other. That's how I think we can enrich and make our international development cooperation or South-South cooperation more effective. I'm also not trying to say that South-South cooperation is the only solution. We do have North-South cooperation. There's the importance of that also. It is also very important. And there is also possibility, and many organizations are working on that, which we call as a triangular cooperation. I think all these things can be enriched further by more active participation of all the stakeholders. Excellent. Now you have heard uh, six of our very eminent panelists from a variety of experiences. One idea that occurred to me looking at the panel here is that the future composition of FIDC could also include some of the private sector people that have been currently limited to civil society and academic institutions along with the ministry. Uh, may I now request you, sir, Amarji, to share some thoughts based on what you have heard, and then we will open it up for some questions or comments from the floor. No, thank you. Thank you very much. A uh, few things which, on behalf of Governor Vidya, I'd like to say, and what has come across here, uh, listening to all of you. See, number one, of course, BRICS uh, in reaction, of course, we'll be chairing BRICS, and joint BRICS projects in developing countries will increasingly become uh, important. Uh, that's a policy I think we'll take. We have already created the uh, new development bank, or what's known as the BRICS bank, uh, and we are looking at projects to do it together. Uh, of course, the important element there, C20, is also will have prominence in the BRICS relations, because uh, we, have, we understand that these discussions have to go beyond nothing. Second, uh, on our part, we can assure you that there is growing realization that it is increasing in the private sector where you have the resources, the technology, and the trained manpower. So the fact that the governments will have to necessarily rely on them, I thought it doesn't escape anybody. Uh, third point that the gentleman from Tata has mentioned about disaster response, that is increasingly a key element of how we react to situations. Uh, of course, civil society and companies who have people on the ground have the ability to mobilize people quickly. But there are some other areas of disaster response where necessarily the role of the state will be very, very important. For example, what we saw in the evacuation, say, in Yemen or in Libya, where you need uh, actually uh, state resources. You need the Navy, you need the Air Force, Air Force uh, and others to evacuate people. So we have to partner together. Uh, CSOs, NGOs, very clearly they have an important role. Few that come to my mind immediately, first of course, because they are connected with the community, the need assessment, the, in, they have a very definite role in terms of ascertaining or, or projecting what is required in a particular community. 
then of course, like as was mentioned here, do case studies. Case studies are good examples, stories where we can transpose or transplant uh, good experiences uh, from one geography to another. And of course, the documentation. Governments, at least Government of India, uh, I can confess that is fairly weak when it comes to documentation of these uh, good experiences. So we feel that uh, CSOs can play a role in both the back assessment of the program as well as the uh, sort of uh, documentation that uh, we need to have. On the SDF and UN voluntary, well, SDF is, uh, is taking, I would say, a baby step, but the right step. Uh, it shows that a lot can be done even together. Uh, yes, that is true what he said, that we are the least integrated uh, region. But we are also a region uh, which perhaps has the most in common. And this is the irony of the region that what actually unites us is also the reason why we are divided. Uh, it is uh, perhaps a legacy of history. Uh, FIBC, of course, I have interacted with them. It's a great initiative. Uh, in fact, our development partnership and uh, engagement with the world had been fairly reactive. When I say reactive, it is basically saying demand-driven, that we went wherever there was a request to receive from our partner countries. What FIDC I saw was doing was also developing a, a theoretical framework, uh, the philosophy behind the development, which we feel uh, as India grows as an aid or assistance provider from, the, from an aid receiver, this will be a great underpinning for the activities that government takes. So I'll stop with that and perhaps we will take questions from the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a few minutes we have for questions and comments from the floor. Trying to figure out uh, who will... Did I see a hand? Did you see a hand? Yeah. One, one there, one here. question or comment? I know all of you are tired and the panel spoke brilliantly. Either of you want to take a crack at that? Just, just on the question of uh, transparency of budgets, you know, we have very strict procedures of um, uh, how we really, uh, and, and, and governance of how we make social investments. And we actually have a scorecard where some of the parameters that I've listed, like you know, business alignment, the needs of the community, the scalability of a project, the, the, the acceptance in the community, the stakeholder relationships, all have been given weights. So uh, it's not just that we see and we jump into a project and just do it. It's a set procedure of due diligence that's followed. 
and uh, there's a minimum threshold beyond which only we are able to allocate our own CSR budget into the project. Of course, if we work with other stakeholders, there's a pooling of funds, but um, most projects for corporates come from their own CSR budgets. Uh, just to add to that, <clears throat> one of the things that, uh, that companies tend to be automatically very careful about is when they spend money, where is it going? And that's, a, that's sort of the instinct uh, that companies have. Uh, so that happens anyway in different forms depending on the projects. But I think one has to also uh, grant uh, a lot of credit to the Companies Act and Clause 135 of the Companies Act to deal with CSR. Because what it done is two, two very important things. One is it is also mandated reporting. So there is a need to report and put that out in the public domain. Second is it has raised the discussion on CSR to a board because you have to have a CSR committee of the board. And in large companies, like many of our companies, one of the members of the board has to be an independent director. So you automatically have a lot of governance, objective governance systems in place. And since the CSR committee has to sign off on the report, they will ask a whole lot of questions relating to, as Vinita said, to why are you doing a particular project, to what has happened as a result of it, and therefore what are they going to report. So I think there are in, uh, both internal and external processes that are automatically there in companies, which ensure that some level of understanding of where it is happening and what that money is doing, uh, it comes to the fore and is reported transfer. Thank you, uh, panelists. Three takeaways for me. One is that uh, just as the composition of the panel represents, I think it's kind of a multi-channel, multi-stakeholder engagement in South South Cooperation uh, should converge in future. We do our things directly, one-on-one, -on -one, civil society, civil society, government, government, private sector, private sector, but we should also find ways to converge as this conversation is. Second, I think uh, learning uh, is reciprocal. It's not one-way learning. And even when we talk about South-South cooperation, we should not lose sight of the fact that there are interesting and innovative examples coming from other countries. And just because a large country like India has a variety of contexts and communities and a longer period of post-independent action for the last 60 years, it does not mean that uh, smaller countries and newer countries don't have ideas and experiences for us to learn from. And thirdly, I think the, the idea that the Saak Development Fund represents is in itself a model for South-South cooperation. And perhaps there is a possibility to engage other regional development funds of similar variety as we move forward. Not just the, the IFIs or the Asian Development Bank or those banks, but also regional uh, Latin American and African and uh, East Asian kind of uh, mechanisms that may be in place. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, panelists. And maybe now we can invite the people who are going to conduct the closing session of this. Thank you very much.